Thank you, Gideon. I don't, I don't even know where to start to respond to everything that you said, but there was so much in there that you said. But I think the stats that really got me was in any gathering of 200, you know, at least 10 percent will be going through a situation. And I'm sure that's church, but I'm sure that's also in most other gatherings, you know, and I think that just shows you how prevalent this is. And, and, and the points you make around, you know, think about the impact of your actions. I think sometimes we're, we're too quick, you know, learn to listen before jumping to conclusion. No one chooses, that was good to become unwell. Life happens, you know, and I think just remembering that sometimes is a good thing and to refer people on, you know, if you don't know, just there, there's so many ways we can refer people on. Drop us an email, you know, you know, call out to somebody, you know, but refer people on. Don't try to do what you're not capable of doing. And today really is about equipping us. Part of this, all of today, is so that you and I can feel a bit more equipped, at least to know how to point people, if that's what we want to do on the next step. And I've noticed that um, Dr. Shade Olajubu has been, has been putting on, on the chat lots of signs and ways to recognize, you know, whether you're going through depression or something, please, please look at the chat because there's a lot of stuff in there that is an advice also going on in there. So thank you so much for that and for being so vulnerable. You know, I think a lot, I think about our men, there's a question later on about men, you know, that came up as well, you know, I think we also need to hear that message as well. So I'm going to now ask um, a Sheila to, to our next panelist, to talk, Sheila, Sheila is the director and founder of BMR Health and Wellbeing. Um, Sheila has worked in fast-paced organizations for, for many years, for about over 30 years. She's managed large teams globally, and she, she experienced first and the need for more awareness and the ability to support mental health issues in the world workplace, sorry. So she'll be talking about that um, to us um, in a minute, about workplace, about taking personal responsibility for our well-being um, as well. So Sheila, over to you. Thank you, Fola. Nice to meet you, everybody. Um, yeah, as Fola, um, I think she, you know, she started the beginning of the session earlier on talking about a book, a friend of yours that wrote about extreme stress at work. Um, and for me, that's kind of where my own kind of battles with mental health really started. Um, you know, I grew up in a pretty tough background, um, you know, it was kind of dog eat dog, um, very poor, and I learned to be very strong, I learned to be very resilient, um, um, I was in and out of foster care from the age of four till the age of ten, um, with absent parents here and there, so over the years I, I became to be very resilient, and I... Um, became quite successful in my career um, and worked really, really hard. And then at the age of um, 40, I was a director. I'd got where I wanted to do in my career. Um, but then I really started to struggle. I had a baby um, and my career was on a certain trajectory. And then after I had the baby, the people that I worked for, and it was a very male driven organisation, told me that they felt my, um, my career um, aspirations had changed and that they were no longer having me on this career path. So that really knocked my mental health, that really knocked my confidence, that really made me question myself. And it really um, started my journey into kind of depression um, and mental ill health. And I think, you know, we've listened to the statistics um, around mental health, you know, one in four um, in the UK in the workplace suffer with mental ill health. Have you put that? as a percentage, we're talking 25% of the people in the company that you go to every day will be struggling. A quarter yeah. of people will be struggling every day. Now, I worked in this organisation. In my particular department, there were 35 people. Six of those, um, if I counted myself, all struggled with mental ill health. Some of them would be people that were having panic attacks on the way into work, just over the amount of stress of the, of the job on the day to day. Some people were managing that um, their mental ill health well through medication and through counselling. And then I had one lady in particular that one day she came into the office and her, her hair looked very different. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, that, your hair looks um, nice. Um, it was blonde. She normally had brown hair. And then all of a sudden she just pulled the wig she was wearing, because I didn't realise it was a wig, off her head and said, uh, my husband said I was ugly, therefore I shaved all my hair off. 
for the weekend. <sighs> and I was just like, wow, what do I say to that? How do I support this lady that is in absolute crisis? And I went to see um, our HR people and they told me to basically say nothing that might upset her and do nothing. Um, since that happened, there were another couple of incidences um, that ended up with this um, young lady actually being sectioned. And as a manager in a business, I felt completely and utterly paralysed in terms of how to help her. Uh, long story short, I continue to struggle with my um, job um, after that. And things just kind of built up and built up. Um, and I eventually ended up leaving um, the workplace. Um, took me a little bit of time to kind of find out, you know, what I needed to do. And, you know, since leaving in that role, I then found out that the other directors in that, in that business were also suffering with stress, with anxiety and with depression. And I think what we find in the workplace as well, um, as in our communities, is that this is real kind of toxic masculinity about speaking up and saying that you can't cope for fear of potentially losing your job, for potentially being looked over for promotion or all of these other things as being seen as being weak. Um, and it took me a long time, um, even through the work that we were doing um, subsequently kind of after I left and I decided that I wanted to go back into the workplace and try and educate people that it's okay not to be okay. Um, and kind of just build that awareness piece about depression. And it wasn't until I went on um, a mental health first aid training course that I actually had that light bulb moment when I realized I'd been struggling with depression and I'd self-medicated with alcohol for absolutely years. And I remember the lady, I know the lady that was um, delivering the session and she was just waiting for me to kind of, for that light bulb moment here. And it was a, it was a small, it was a short video, a three minute video, it was an animated video uh, about depression. And, um, and it was done in the fight kind of a form of a dog of this dog growing in shape and taking over in life. And it just made me realize that I was absolutely struggling. And I literally left the session booked in to see my GP, um, was given medication, was referred to CBT counselling, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd really, really started um, to get a very good grip on what was going on. Um, and yeah, alcohol was, you know, for me, we've, you know, we've heard the conversations throughout today about, you know, the things that we can do to help ourselves and, and Sade saying, you know, that we need these 79 hours of sleep a night. I was functioning on three to four hours of sleep every night. I would drink, I would self-medicate with red wine. I would fall asleep at nine, 10, 11 o'clock. In fact, I wouldn't fall asleep, I would pass out on the sofa. Um, and, and then I would wake up at three o'clock in the morning with anxiety, with my brain racing, um, really 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 struggling to get back to sleep and then I'd be oh you know trying to just get back on that hamster wheel and trying to cope I gave up alcohol um I just one day woke up and thought I've had enough I've absolutely had enough of this um I gave up alcohol and within a week or in fact within three days I was sleeping 10 hours a night good solid, wholesome sleep that we started to restore my mental health more than any medication, more than anything else I was given. Sleep was a massively, massive, important factor in terms of my recovery. Um, so, and, you know, I think with mental health, we, you know, when we talk about mental health, we tend to have these very negative connotations. So I think, Fowler, you said at the beginning, you say mental and you expect, you know, the crazy person at the mental asylum. And when we talk about mental health, we never think of mental good health. We never think of the positive side of mental health. It always tends to have this negative connotation. Um, and this is where, you know, we spend so much time in the workplace workplace has so much impact on us these days technology has such an impact on us these days because we never switch off on the workplace and at the moment covid's making that even worse because you know we bring work home when we leave the office sometimes we might check a few emails till seven eight and nine o'clock at night but you know we now find that you know during covid with our mental health first 
aid courses that we've been teaching, you know, we took them online and our um, de the demand for those courses has gone absolutely off the scale. And I'm seeing people from lots, you know, either individuals or be people from different organisations, small businesses, large businesses. We've had ministers on from, um, you know, um, churches. Um, lots of people now looking at how they can support the people, the communities, the families all around them. Um, you know, and Sade has given out lots of information earlier about how we can do all of these things that are really, really good for us in terms of the physical pillars of um, good nutrition and exercise and all the rest of it. I knew all of that. I knew all of the good things that I should be doing. What I really struggled to do was to get out of my head and actually put them into practice. And it was this self-harm and this not feeling that you're good enough, not feeling that you're worthy enough. And it's trying to get out of that mindset and break that cycle of destructive behavior or sabotaging behavior. And for me, it was alcohol. It absolutely was alcohol. And that gets me every time. And I think, you know, with the start of, with COVID, people are struggling. We've already touched on um, the lack of structure, the lack of not having a day. Um, you know, when we couldn't go out, you know, we were getting this one hour of exercise and then we're stuck in the house. You know, unless you were living in the world of, you know, happy, you know, everything is really, really happy and really positive. I would, you know, I would challenge everybody on here to say that they haven't experienced some level of emotional turmoil throughout this period um you know i've got to you know we've we kind of get in what are we now um since march and we're in october since lockdown and i can feel that my mental health you know it's taken a toll david spoke earlier about the stages of grief and i've certainly gone through that and i feel like you know i've arrived at a point where i'm needing to reach out for help again um and it's one of those where as a sufferer you're generally the last person to see it. It's the people around you that start to spot the signs and symptoms that Sade has been, been putting in the chat. Um, and it's just, for me, it's really important that while we spend so much time in the workplace, that there's a lot of education around the workplace. Um, our workplaces are diverse places. So we have people from all communities. So within the workplace, we can kind of have mental health awareness, just the basic spotting signs and symptoms, just the basics of how to have a conversation, how to listen non-judgmentally, how to offer support and signpost to people, then that's fantastic. Um, and that's great for us as individuals, but employers also need to take on a bit more responsibility and they need to look at the factors that are causing workplace stress in the first instance and look at how we can organize um, our work environments to remove some of those stresses. So we're very good at putting mental health first aiders in place. We might be very good at giving counsellors, but at that point, we've already got a problem because the stress has already been created. So let's try and take it back and look at ways in which employers can promote flourishing um, and promote happy um, and productive staff that can speak out and say when they're struggling. Wow. And that's it. Thank you. Wow, that, that, that was really helpful. I mean, there's so much I could I could say, but I think you said so much in there, you know. I mean, sleep, oh, sleep, oh, sleep. I think sleep is the first one most of us have to just find a way to tackle, you know. Uh, and I like the mental good health that you said, because obviously that starts to change our mindset around mental health. There's also mental good health. Good health. Yeah, because we, when we talk about mental health, we talk about mental illness. We don't talk about health. Exactly. So I think that that is brilliant. So thanks for that. Um, I'm going to, we're going to come back with the questions. So please put your questions in there. So the questions we will take. So so don't worry, just just keep giving us the questions. And um, Jason is picking them all up and he'll be coming on shortly soon. But before then, I've got one more um, panelist to, to sort of introduce. And that is Dr. Ungozi Olonye. Um, she's a consultant pediatrician in neurodisability um, at the Great Almond Street Hospital for Children. I mean, she does quite a lot and, and I've got pages here, but I'm sure it'll come out when she, she's talking to you. But she's going to talk to us about, about mental health as well, which is what we've been talking about. And she has that unique perspective as well on children, which I think is just absolutely amazing. 
So over to you, Ngozi. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much, Fola. Um, I've just been listening, wrapped, listening to everybody um, over the last hour. Um, Abigail, um, Lydia, Fola, yourself, Shadi, Gideon, Sheila, you've said it all. And um, I've learned so much, but I was thinking about in the work that I do with children as well, looking at the statistics, Fola and I were looking at some statistics yesterday. Um, and I was so surprised at some of what I've learned. Um, I do work with children with complex disability um, and parents obviously as well. A lot of moms come into the clinic and you do know that um, they may not be seeing this, but there are huge numbers of stresses um, that are going on, not just in the parents' lives, in the lives of the children. And so I was looking at statistics around the prevalence of mental health worldwide. And you realize that there is quite a public health burden. It's a public health problem globally. Depression is a very common illness, more than 300 million people affected. Um, and this is coming from WHO stats. Um, and at its worst, as you know, depression can lead to suicide. With close to a million people dying um, due to suicide every year. And this, this, this statistic that suicide is a second leading cause of death in 15 to 29 year olds. And that's, that's a, such a stark uh, statistic. And in my field, I know that many mental disorders have age of onset in childhood and in adolescence, not always picked up, um, but the vast majority of anxiety and disruptive behaviors start in adolescence. Um, children who some of them may not have uh, a developmental diagnosis that's easily recognizable. And we, we know about the sort of the ADHDs, the autisms, intellectual disability, but they are children who um, are, have unrecognized difficulties which lead on, lead to um, depression, anxiety, self-harm. And um, in my previous job, when I worked in the community services, um, I won't say where I worked, but I knew that there were certain areas of that community, certain schools, for instance, where we had huge incidents of self-harming in girls, particularly girls. So if I saw a child in clinic um, and they had their hoodie on or their um, sleeves down and, you know, they're not talking, um, they're very silent sometimes, they turn their backs to you. One of the things I used to try to do is, um, you know, just make sure I can quickly examine them. And when you pull the sleeves up and you see that they've been cutting themselves um, and then that sometimes leads to an opportunity to speak and, and to deal with some of those issues. I looked at some of the statistics um, um, collected by the Department of Health um, between January and October 2017. This is just in England here. And they looked at 9,000 children aged between two and 19. And the survey combined reports from children, parents and teachers depending on the age of the child. And what they found was that one in eight, five to 19 year olds had a mental disorder. One in 20, that's 25%, sorry, of five to 19 year olds met the criteria for two or more um, mental health disorders. And young people aged 17 to 19 were three times more likely to have a disorder than preschool children. So there was that exponential increase, but starting in preschool children with actually 5% of them having a disorder um, and by 17 to 19, 16.9%, that's a huge number. And that was just within the UK. What we'll be looking for are the stats over the last six months with COVID-19. And so whilst I was thinking about this, I thought, well, 
you know, the issue about mental health disorder, this is, we're talking mainly about adults, we have been, but we're looking at a holistic thing. We're looking at families and the recognition and sometimes the lack of recognition early on. Um, we've talked about barriers. Um, some of those barriers, as we know, include um, stigma, um, not recognizing, not knowing where to go. Um, and I have to say, I think I see um, children, fewer children of black and ethnic minority in my practice over the last 30 years working in England. I see fewer of them referred with sort of mild to moderate symptoms than severe symptoms. So you wonder, well, where all the rest, where, what's happening to all the rest of them? Those with mild to moderate symptoms, they're not being recognized. So um, it's really just thinking about this and preparing about this, I thought, well, really mental health and me, how does that affect me, me, you, all of us as individuals, as parents, because with all of us here, we're either mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, uncle, aunties, godmothers, godfathers. So many of us have different roles here. Um, and so, we would be affected on one in one um, phase or the other. So I developed this little acrostic while I was thinking about this, just using the, the um, first letters of uh, the phrase mental health. Um, I really developed it while I was thinking about writing a talk for something else, the ethnic minority group where there's a stigma around mental health and where things are not spoken about but people soldier on until there's a crisis. Um, and so um, I'm just gonna sum up here. Um, I've given you some statistics. The statistics are quite stark, um, but I thought, okay, so M, M for mental health, M affects me. What the, the, the this, this is a, a disorder that affects me, my family. Um, and that M can also stand for medication, which in, in the right hands, when used um, in a thoughtful, understanding way about what the symptoms are, medication is useful, very, very useful, very needed, um, and there's an evidence base behind it. E, mental health affects the effects on me and my family. N, it's not somebody else's issue, <laughs> it's our issue. T, we talk about it, we're doing that today. A, awareness is key. Being aware, getting information. L is letting go of the stigma and laughter. We, we heard about that earlier, but letting go of that stigma, talking about it. H, help is always available. Um, e, exploring possibilities. A, there's always a solution always a solution and we must, the L is looking forward to change. We must look forward to change and T would be taking control with God or your faith. We talked about that earlier on. So that the last thing, H, we have healthy mind, body and soul. So that's my little acrostic. I come from a family that's been touched by mental health stresses in several forms. We've had bereavement, we've had trauma, anxiety, depression, divorce, separation, chronic illness, physical illness, dementia, my mother suffers with that. We've had early untimely sudden deaths. So to summarize, it affects all of us, but there is help out there. And I thank you, Paula, for bringing this topic today because you've helped increase that awareness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ngozi. That, 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 was, that was awesome and, and we will share you know, that the morning with everybody as well. So you, you'll all get to see, because I think it, it, it's really powerful. Um, so we'll share that um, with you all that, that's watching today. Um, I'm going to pan over to Jason now, and, and Jason's going to sort of take us through a, a session with questions and answers. So he's been looking at all the chat um, and what you've been saying. He's been trying to read your mood as well. So those of you who are not sort of, who have your videos on. I'm sure Jason's been scanning to try and see what's going on and what you're thinking. But I'm gonna hand over to Jason now, um, who's going to sort of 
lead the questions and the answer and ask the panel some questions. And if you have particular questions that you really want Jason to pick up, please put it in the chat and he will make sure that he picks it up. And here we'll pick up some of the questions that were also sent to us um, before the session as well. So Jason, over to you. Thank you, yeah, so, so actually we've, we've got around 15 minutes or so to, to cover this. Um, and I think some of the questions that were sent beforehand have actually been answered through the, through the evening, which has been good. But just a, a couple of others that are, are quite key and I think should be looked at. Um, one of them, I think I'm going to point to Shade because I think you did make a, a response to a similar topic in the chat, which is how can a, a parent or family members best support a child that hasn't been diagnosed officially with a mental health disorder, but they have uh, particularly dropped out of education, their formal education, they're not actively looking for work and they're spending an increasing amount of time shutting themselves away indoors. Richard Ngozi, because I think she's the expert, but I think um, we've said it so many times in so many different ways today, that one of the key things is for us as parents, and I'm a parent, I've got adult children, to be aware of behavioural changes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not expecting everybody to be doctors or clinicians or psychologists, but I think the key point is that if you see a marked change in the behaviour of a young person or even an adult for that um, for that reason, then it may be that we're in the, we've gone from the domain of mental health to mental health difficulties to mental health illness. Now, just to basically say that in this system, the, uh, in this country, the way it works is that the primary point of accessing um, health um, input is from the GP. So unless you have a concern about risk, it should be supporting that young person or that adult to go to the GP. If you think there is a concern about risk, and I'm talking specifically now about the risk of suicide, then don't wait to go to the GP because it can be a quite a long winded process. Support that person to go to accident and emergency. Every accident and emergency department in this country has an on-call psychiatric team attached and you can access emergency psychi psychiatric input. So that's saying it very simply, but I'm gonna hand over to Ngozi just to talk about because that's her area of specialty. Thank you, Shade. Ngozi? Yes, no, I, 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 I completely agree with what Shade is saying. Um, um, don't minimize things, um, you must listen. I think as a parent, you, you do have to listen. And actually, sometimes asking a direct question to a young person that you think might be a bit intrusive is not wrong. So asking a direct question and have you thought of doing something to yourself? Have you thought of harming yourself? That doesn't lead to them going to do it, um, but it might open up, it might open up a conversation or it might open up um, an avenue for you to certainly look for help. Yes, first and foremost, GP in the, in the UK is where you would go, um, is, is um, what you would seek to do. Really important to engage with schools as much as you can with class teachers, if possible. Children are different in different circumstances. What you see at home might not be what's happening at school. Um, they are, they can be difficulties as well, I know, in getting through to certain schools. I would say if a parent feels worried, take along an advocate, somebody who can walk with them and ask questions that they might want to ask or be too scared to ask, but make sure that your voice is heard. From my experience, the children and the parents that get support are the ones where there is a voice. There is a voice, there's an advocate, and you're not just sitting quietly and hoping things get better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, but there's quite a few um, family related questions actually. So I'll go on to the next one. Um, and there's also one that's come into the chat that I'm going to refer to as well. What, what action can family members take when an, an adult member is suffering from mental health illnesses but will not engage with anyone and any service? Any, any of the panelists want to take that, please? Shade? Should I, should I? 
sometimes, as I think as Ungazi alluded to and other panelists, sometimes somebody has a mental illness. There's something, especially from our culture, where we don't acknowledge or we don't recognize mental illness. And so sometimes what happens is it's um, it gets really extreme. Um, if you have an individual who is not accepting that they have a mental illness, then again, the starting point is the GP, and I'm trying not to get technical, but the general practitioner can arrange for a mental health act assessment where they can arrange for um, a team to come to the house. It's normally two um, doctors who are spe specially trained in mental health and um, somebody called an approved mental health worker who's normally a social worker. And the GP arranges that they come to the house and they do an assessment in the house. And then they make a decision as to whether that person can be treated at home or whether that person needs to come into hospital. So that's really at the extreme end. I would go back to what Ungozi said. I think it's talk, talk, talk. You know, sometimes we're too scared to ask the questions. Um, it's always helpful if you see somebody struggling, you know, we nobody know, wants to know how much you know unless they know you care so start that conversation and I say that as somebody as well just like Ungozi where there's mental health difficulties on both sides of the family and sometimes the start of a solution is beginning a conversation as we've done today and so grateful to follow for being able to have this platform for all of us to share our personal and professional knowledge. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, I think also, what, just to add, add to that, Jason, I think it's also important when you're having those conversations is to put your own personal judgment aside. Um, because my, my partner, for example, has always had very good mental health. So he does not understand depression. And the worst thing he ever said to me or could ever say to me, well, it's just about your mindset. You just have to think happy, at which point I wanted to kill him. Um, because if I could just think myself happy, I wouldn't sit being so miserable. Um, so I think, you know, we all have a different window on the world, a different perspective on the world. So when we are talking to somebody, whether you think they should snap out of it or just take a decision to be happier, keep those thoughts to yourself. Listen non-judgmentally and just let that person speak and let that person be heard and understood because that, that's what they're looking for. Thank you, Sheila, for that. Um, there's another one, which is, this is all about how to start a conversation, actually, in the home. So obviously we're having this, these, this forum, which is great, but somebody's asked about their son, who's um, at college at the moment, inform them that they're having an episode of anxiety. They're not sure if it's the first time that it's actually exhibiting and having an episode. How can they begin a conversation with him when he's refusing to engage on the subject? What's the best way to facilitate that, that conversation? I think, I think it's probably not to disengage. Don't, don't isolate or step away from the conversation. Step into it with courage. Um, and even if he doesn't respond, is to still bring up the subject, allow him space to hear, and, and then be consistent with that message or so every now and then go back and, and again ask him how he's feeling um are, are there symptoms of stress are there things that he has done so those direct questions that have been mentioned before is don't be afraid to ask those questions but the worst thing you could do is allow him to isolate because as he isolates then he becomes the potential for more depression uh, and more anxiety and and more sort of self-blame so I would say keep engaging and also give him space to listen and to keep talking and be consistent, build a structure around it. Thank you very much. That's great. The, the, the questions are now flowing in, so I'm going to pick some more. I've got some more written down as well, but um, somebody's asked specifically, um, how can they deal with mental health issues that arise from other health issues? Sorry, can you say that question again, Jason? Yeah, of course I can, yeah. So Please. Uh, yeah, they've asked specifically, how can you deal with mental health issues that have arisen from another health issue? Okay, well, I think as we, we kind of alluded to, um, mental health illness and mental health difficulties can allude from physical health issues and they can... Um, be precipitated by social issues as well. And then some mental health difficulties. 
difficulties lead to other mental health difficulties. So I think the most important thing is, as we've all said today, is to start a conversation and then to seek professional help where indicated. But I always give an example. So for example, if somebody's suffering from depression because they have a relationship difficulty, for example, with their partner, it might be that what they need to do is go and seek some relationship you know, from an expert like David, you know, in terms of having family therapy or couple therapy. So in some ways it's about trying to get support to work out what is causing the mental health difficulty and then dealing with the root cause if it can be dealt with. Thank you very yeah. much, that's great. Yeah, just to add to that, um, just to add to what Shadi has said, I think it's really very important for us to do and address the primary, the primary um, mental health issue. So the, the, the hope is that, like uh, Shadi said, the root cause, the hope is that when you deal with the primary issue, then other comorbidities will be resolved. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to say, you Yes, I just, just wanted to add to that. The thing about it is if you've got a physical issue, I don't know whatever it is, back pain, hip pain, diabetes, whatever it is, chronic headache, you'll be worrying about it if you haven't sought help. So you worry about it, you're anxious about it, you might be talking about it, but you haven't dealt with it. So yeah. you're going through a spiral there of rumination and worry. It's an unresolved thing. And soon you might find you, you're talking about it, you're not sleeping well. And it could be something that could be dealt with easily. But if it is chronic pain, um, mm. pain can lead to depression. Anxiety can lead to depression. So really the thing is, to deal with whatever that physical issue is. There's, if there's a fear of whatever it is, oh, I've got a lump, I've got a funny mark on my skin, could this be cancer? That alone, um, that barrier to just seeking help is really where we need to start with. Just, just do it. Just do it. I've got a slide that just says, just do it. Talk to somebody if you can't make yourself call the GP, tell your friend about it and get, get somebody, a strong person who can go along with you to help solve that health issue. And then um, hopefully the others will follow. Thank you, Gideon, you, you had your hand up as well. Um, I, I could make it quick. Um, as a pastor, I will say we are very guilty of this. God hates divorce. So, um, Children will be, are being raised in a very, very toxic environment where there is abuse taking place. And because God hates divorce, everything is done to keep them together. And they stay in that toxic situation and create and foment and ferment and develop that toxic environment. And the children ended up suffering for it. So pastors, please. Let's not use that to destroy the lives of children. Um, I quoted um, Professor Barbara Sahakian from Cambridge, mentioning teenagers are more likely to suffer from depression if they see their parents arguing often. If they are at each other's throats, they are more likely to suffer from mental health illness. So the pastors who keep homes together because God has divorce and the force and they, they, they cover it. I'm not saying break up homes, but let them seek treatment. If it's the man, let him get the, the help he needs. If it's a woman, let her get the help he needs, she needs. So the home will be an, a conducive environment for the children growing up. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna take one last one, which, uh, which actually came through before this event, um, but I think it's quite poignant that we talk about it. Um, and this was one, Ngozi, that you were particularly interested in, which was that the, the NHS have, uh, figures have said that black women of an African descent are five times more likely than any other group to get a diagnosis of a, a mental health illness. Um, what is the underlying reasons for that? Okay, I think we've dealt with a lot of this, I must say, during the course of the afternoon. Mm. But if you look at the stats, if you look at the statistics, there are racial disparities in access to mental health. I alluded a little bit to it in terms of children, in terms of developmental difficulties. When I think of the kids that I see um, who are referred in, and I wonder, well, actually, where are these kids? Why aren't I seeing these black kids with these 
moderate difficulties that we could think about, but you see them when they've been excluded from school and where they're, they're in a pupil referral unit, et cetera. So I think there are some racial, um, there are some quite racial disparities there. And then the evidence does suggest that um, black and ethnic minority groups, well, I can talk about it, the evidence in the UK, at a higher risk of mental ill health, um, certainly within the UK. And for some, um, I would say probably men more than women, sometimes their first, um, their, their, their first appointment or their first visit or their first um, encounter with mental health services are via the criminal, um, well, the forensic route perhaps, where it's recognized that this person has committed a crime, et cetera, et cetera. There might be some mental health um, issues there. I'm sure Shadi um, would know more about that. But with our Black Af uh, our, our, our women, you know, there is a, there, there's culture, there's a stigma. We've talked about that. There's the, oh, God will solve it. If you're a Christian, you know, let's pray and fast and, and let's cast things out, which is all has its own, uh, you know, its own uh, place. But there is also that thing of thinking you're the only one. There's no one who can help. Um, some people are quite isolated. If you think if people have migrated from one country to the next, they could be quite isolated. And there's also this pseudo resilience where you compartment, compartmentalize things and you just keep going. Within that could be a whole range of other things. Domestic violence could be going on. It might not be physical. It can be emotional financial, psychological um, issues going on that they've kind of got used to because maybe even within the culture, it's like, well, actually he hasn't beat you yet. So, you know, you're still okay. So that, that's pseudo resilience. And I have to say there are very many sort of undiagnosed things as well, you know, hypertension, health issues that may not have been dealt with. So when you put all of that together, you've got a little time bomb sitting there and I, and I think what we do end up seeing is that by the time that woman has got to the stage where she is noticed by the health service, I wouldn't say it's too late, but it's that you're pretty, I mean, you're pretty far gone. Um, mm -hmm. And Shade, I mean, I'd be very happy for you to disagree with me, but I, I, that's, that's my take on it from looking at the stats and from working here. Thank you. I agree with Mbali. you and I wanted, I, I agree with you and just for 30 seconds, I wanted to share my own experience. So sure. I'm divorced and my marriage was within the, broke down within the context of domestic violence. And at the period at which I got divorced, there was no support from the church. The thinking was, in fact, I remember somebody telling me, um, we want to give you a cup of tea and send you home, but home was no longer safe. And I'm very aware now with adult children that um, if I had stayed, um, you know, the healthy, well-rounded individual that they are, they would not be. And I battled quite a lot with depression. And I remember feeling that there was no way out. And I think it's because the culture within the black and ethnic minority um, is very prescriptive about divorce and abuse and abuse goes under the parapet. It's also, there's a collusion, there's a cultural collusion. And I think that is why um, you find that many of our women are suffering from mental health difficulties. I, I can't imagine where I would be if I'd stayed, but it was really difficult to come out because I felt like there was no support. I was told at every, you know, you got, you get, get told if you cooked better, if you were quieter, um, if you were not so westernized, um, all sorts of things, you know. Um, and so I think we also, I'm full, I'm shouting out to you. I hope we can have a discussion about domestic violence because I think that's another thing that, that could we need be a to... good subject for another yeah. time. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Shade. Thank you very much, everybody, for your feedback and, and the questions and the answers, etc. Handing back to Faila now to wrap up. Thank you, Jason, and, and thank you for everybody that sent a question in. And I and I hope that just shed a bit of light um, into you know your world and some of the issues that you want us to be able to respond to. I just want to say before I go back to the panel for the closing words that we will continue this conversation um, because I think it's very difficult to cover the breadth of everything that is in each of our own environment or the thoughts or, or the barriers or 
all those things that, that just need to be shifted a little bit to enable us to contribute um, effectively into this area. So I wanna continue the conversations. I'm gonna ask all of you beyond today that if you have a question, if you have a thought on your mind, if you, if you have something you'd like our panel to, to answer, um, just drop me an email at on the couch at folacomolafe.com. That's on the couch at folacomolafe.com. You can take a picture of that. There's also a number that you can text. So just drop that to us and I will be in touch with the panel and we will respond. And what we will do is we will, we will obviously anonymize everything that comes through so that we can share it with everyone because what may be going on in my life may also be useful for somebody. So, we, so don't worry about that. Um, we won't identify anyone, we'll anonymize everything and then compile it and send it back to this group that have come out for this conversation today. So I want us to continue that. So please, please send those questions in. If you need help, please send that in to us as well. We will connect you and we'll contact um, the panel and, and find a way. We, we are a community. We're a community. And I use the word on one of my conversations, which I think I got from Jason about safeguarding our community. And that's what we're really trying to do. We want to safeguard ourselves as a community. So I'm going to ask the panel members now for one final word. And, and what I'm asking them to do is, is a little takeaway. You know, we've said a lot today. I'm sure there's a lot going on in your mind like it is in my mind at the moment, you know. So I'm just going to ask the panel to, to just give one final word, just, just a sentence, nothing, nothing detailed that, that anybody listening can take away. We all want to be part of turning the statistics around. You know, we, we don't want our young people suffering. We don't want the suicide rates going up. We don't want people in pain. We don't want, you know, people just, just feeling there's no hope. We, we, don't, we don't want that, you know? So I'm gonna ask them for one word that you and I can take away that helps us to hold on even, or to be of help to somebody else um, that is around us. So I'm going to start with, with David, if that's okay. No problem. Um, what I would say is, I think I'll go back to what I said before, is always recognize that our mind will always tend to go to the worst case scenario by its nature to protect and, and survive. But don't, don't dwell on the negative. Don't dwell in the worst case scenario and in the worst case emotion. And if you find that you are ruminating in that space, and you can't let it go, reach out to someone, speak to someone and try and let it out. Do not hold it in. That's where the problem starts. Thank you very much, David. Shade. I would just like to say to everybody listening that, you know, mental illness is nothing to be ashamed of. I'm somebody who's battled with mental illness and you are just too precious to keep on suffering. Please, you've heard so much advice today and follow us there as a link. Please shout for help if you need it. Thank you. Thank you, Shadi. Lydia? Yeah, one thing I would like us to take away uh, today, a lot has been said. I just want to encourage us not to suffer alone. I don't want, I want to encourage us not to suffer in silence, to challenge our self-stigma as individuals and as a community to challenge social stigma. So let's seek help, let's seek support early, early, and be open about our mental health. I want to advise us to take responsibility for our well-being and, and avoid judging others and support each other. Let's be part of the solution. Thank That's you. That's what I would like to say. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Abigail may not have been expecting this, but Abigail, where are you? I'm here. Um, I think mine would be strength is also accepting vulnerability. So speak out. Yeah. Um, you don't have to pretend. That would be my final words. Thank, thank you, Abigail. Alexandria. Hi, um, I think mine would be that uh, focusing on young people, um, linking to Lydia, you're still in a position where you can really change the trajectory 
for your mental health as you go into adulthood. So really take um, take it serious and um, whatever you've been modeled before, listen to these type of conversations and take responsibility for your mental health, it matters. Thank you, Alexandria. Gideon? I, I would encourage us to seek professional help. And if we are not sure, thankfully there are organizations like On the Couch with Falls who can be like um, um, a, a channel you, you you contact and then they like a, a satellite that beams you in points in the right direction. So take those advantages because your pa you don't go to your pastor if your blood pressure is high and you need medication for that or if you have headache. So your pastor may not be qualified to deal with your mental health issue. Okay, so seek appropriate professional help. Thank you, Gideon. Sheila. Um, I think what I would like to say is, you know, look at the world that we're in today with suicide versus COVID, you know, and year to date, there's been just over a million deaths from COVID, 1.1 million. Um, and, you know, the government's working on a vaccine and we can test and we can find out who's got it, etc, etc. et cetera. Year to date, there's been 856,000 deaths by suicide. Nobody's working on a vaccine. Nobody's working on a specific suicide solution. The, the people that can work on that, the people that can help in that arena is you and me by having the strength to speak out and have a conversation. Because when you speak, others speak and it starts to break down that stigma. Thank you very much, Sheila. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, hi. Yes, I think my take home message is um, you're not alone. You're not the only one. And, that, and there is help out there. Uh, the help will vary according to where you live, obviously. But there is a lot of help, not just through charity, not, not just through the GPs uh, in the UK. But that is where to start through child and adolescent mental health, through emotional well-being services, through some of the charities, we know of the Samaritans and so on, Chadline, there is help. Don't isolate, don't feel isolated. Um, forget pseudo resilience and being super mom or super dad or whatever. And one thing that my daughters have said to me, which is really helpful, is they, they talk about taking a mental health day, a bit like how you have a spa day. So mm -hmm. you take a mental health day. You can do that on the weekend where you catch up on your sleep, you get a good book to read, you go for a walk, you do something that boosts your mental health. So, so that's something we talk about now, taking a mental health break. Thank you very much. I, I, I just want to say thank you to, to everyone, to the audience, all of you that joined in today, because by coming in, you, you're already saying, I want to be part of this change. And I want to know some more and I want to help some more. So I just want to say a big thank you to you. Um, thank you to the panelists. They have been incredibly awesome. And I, I think if you've got your reaction buttons, this is the time to do that reaction button that is like the clap, because I think, I think they've come and they've just shared and poured out so much um, into, into us today. So thank you so much for your time. You know, this is a topic that touches everybody, you know, and it's never too late or too soon to engage with it, you know. Um, and for me, I, I wish I, I know what I, or I knew what I know now many, many years ago, but that's okay because we can all make a difference. So I'm encouraging you as well to, to have these conversations, have them with your friends, have them maybe get a group of people together on Zoom have a conversation, share something that you've learned today, you know, share something that we've talked about today, be vulnerable. You know, if, if you are going through something, share your own story. Tell, storytelling is so important. When we share our stories, people realize that, okay, it's normal, it's okay, you know, and it gives hope as well, because if you've gone through something and you've come out and people see that you've come out, then it also inspires hope in somebody else. So I just want to encourage all of you to, to do something, commit to doing something in terms of raising awareness and talking to somebody else 
as a result of today. Thank you so much for joining us on the Couch with Foles. Um, our next session will let you know, we've already been told to talk about domestic violence. So I'm sure that, that will come up very, very soon. So be on the lookout for that. And if you have any ideas of what you'd like us also to pick up on the Couch with Foles, use that same email and let me know. We're all about having these conversations because that's the way change happens. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Thanks a lot.